Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, what's happening, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Perkelhammer. So, today I have the pleasure of welcoming Barnett Shutman to the show and his. What, what did you call him, uh, Barnett? Your, your frontline army there? You got Sammy. Frontline, frontline, frontline soldiers. soldiers. We got Sammy Shotman. We got Ricky Sabania. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. We've got Sabaya. Sabaya. Yeah. Steve Robinson. Thomas Wood. Corazon Shutman. I don't know if uh, she's there yet or not. But uh, yeah, you, you, you got a whole crew there, Barnett. And this is going to be an awesome uh, conversation. I can't wait for this. Let me give some people uh, a background about um, you folks out there. And. Um, so, all right, among other operations, Barnett runs RVS Fish Roll. Barnett is responsible for importing most Filipino, Red Sea, and all Madagascar and Papua New Guinea fish. Jake Adams calls you a god among men there, Barnett. And uh, I want to thank Jake for suggesting that I have you on the show. Barnett has spent 39 years building export facilities throughout the world, working hand-in-hand -hand with fisheries in the Philippines. I'm going to mispronounce some of these countries. Eritrea, Madagascar, Belize, Fiji, Saudi Arabia, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Sudan. That was an easy one. I should have gotten that one right. Um, this next one I'm not going to get right. Djibouti. Uh, I don't know if I was even close on that one. Tonga, East Timor, Indonesia, Palu, and Papua New Guinea. His goal is to give sustainable livelihoods to folks in coastal communities by educating them on how to collect live ornamental tropical fish in an environmentally safe way through the proper use of monofilament nets. His company, RVS Fish World, conducts net training programs in most regions of the Philippines and Papua New Guinea. Through RVS Four Star Restoration, they are working to restore degraded uh, reefs throughout the Philippines. RVS Fish World has brought numerous new species to hobbyists and has expanded the known range of several species through their collection efforts. Barnett was also honored when one of the fish they discovered, the exceedingly beautiful Bagna wrasse, uh, was described as the Cerebrus. I'm hacking all these names up here, uh, Barnett. Uh, Shumani, after his family name, Barnett also owns 
Indo-Pacific Direct in New York, which in, imports his fish. But before we start chatting with all these uh, folks, I want to thank the sponsors for the show, both Bulkery Supply and Ecotech Marine. I really appreciate these companies supporting the live stream. And I also appreciate all you folks tuning in. Please spread the word. Hit that like button. Subscribe to my channel. And uh, as always, always encourage comments and questions in the chat. So, all right, Barnett, that was a mouthful there at the beginning. I, uh, I apologize for the mispronunciations, uh, but uh, you guys are dealing with some exotic uh, fish and countries and, and what have you. So, um, yeah, man, why don't you um, give everybody um, more of a, a detailed overview in terms of what, uh, what you folks do out there? Well, basically, uh, we are frontline soldiers, as I told you. Basically, we work with the Bureau of Fisheries hand-in-hand uh, and, hand, and uh, doing net training programs throughout the Philippines. Uh, we've been here since, uh, I think, in the 80s. Uh, Steve Robinson started the movement of doing the net training. And as a private company, you know, uh, we need to be on the offense. So... We started doing these uh, net training programs prior to OBS Fish World with our own money. Uh, you know, we, we do ask for some sponsors, you know, if you want a banner, uh, to, to donate, because basically to train each diver costs about anywhere. Matters the, the logistically region that we're training in could be anywhere from 250 to $500 per diver for a seven day training. So that'd be three days classroom, three days open water, and then the graduation. Now, these divers are all excellent divers. It's just the problem is, Eric Keith, is that uh, none of them have been educated in the proper way. Okay, so uh, what we're doing is just giving back to these uh, divers that are on the front line that basically put the food on our table. So we go into, the, uh, into these uh, areas and we put substations up so they don't have to travel to Manila. So basically we get the fish at the substation, we condition the fish, and then we bring them down. Uh, you don't know the logistically uh, problems that we have in everywhere when we set up these stations in the world. People just realize things that these fish just come into their aquarium and, and they don't really know the steps. The steps are literally um, sometimes uh, uh, impossible, but I don't take no for an answer, and I, I really push the limit. I'm very blessed to have the greatest wife on the earth that supported me in, in doing all these places, and then me dragging her all over the world. Uh, Corazon Shutman, uh, she's the backbone of the company, and actually, I have to thank my family. You know, married to a Filipina, you, you marry the family, and it comes with an army. So I'm blessed to have the greatest uh, army in the world because. To set these stations up, you have to have the right people and you have to have, you know, people that you can trust. Because we can't, I can't be everywhere in the world with all these facilities. So luckily, uh, my uh, wife's got six brothers and those six brothers have, you know, they have kids. So it's, um, it's, it's a blessing that it's a family run operation throughout the world. And we have some good, very good partners in different parts of the world. Um, it's a lot of, like I said again, Keith, it's a, a lot of logistically frontline work that is nonstop. Um, what we love doing is educating and giving a livelihood to the, uh, to the coastal communities. Uh, these people are the backbone of our industry and we have to give back. So the reason why we do it privately is that we make sure that it is done properly. You know, when you get, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, we, we have a saying here, uh, NGOs, you know, NGOs, uh, 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 nothing going on, okay? You know, and I'm being frank here, you know, this, when you get all this money and people putting up these, uh, uh, you know, uh, foundations, right? Yeah, the nine government organizations. Right, nine government organizations. And, you know, you, you, where's it really trickle down? You know, and I hate to you know, emphasize this, but that's the, the, the facts. So, well, we, we do it privately is because it's done right and we and the money gets right to the divers, okay? We, this is no self-glory. This is hard work. No company will do this, you know, 
most of no companies would do this. You know, you have to give back and we have to be sustainable. So this is why we love doing what we're doing, doing that training. I think we've trained now in the last five years. How many divers? 150. 150 divers in the last uh, five wow. years. I think there was total to trained. I think total to be trained about 500. So, you know, with the COVID, that stopped, uh, stopped for two years. We couldn't get in areas because of the COVID. So now with the COVID, uh, basically, thank God, it's like a regional flu. Um, we're now uh, starting up the net training in, I think, uh, the two areas, no, three areas. We're going to go back to Maponis and, and Northern Samoa and set up a substation. And then we're going to be going out to, um, oh, it's on my, their teeth, they're pointing at me, my staff, it's on, on so I got to put my glasses on here. Um, third page. Third page? Okay. As you can see, I'm very prepared here. Um, let's see. Okay, so we'll be in, uh, starting, uh, we'll be doing in Ricky. Have, come here. Have you pronounced oh, yeah. oh, yeah. At least Palmyon I'm not the only one that can't pronounce <laughs> stuff. Listen, I'm from the Bronx, so I don't pronounce nothing. Okay, so Palion Islands, the most northern part of the Philippines. So basically, when you go to the end of the most northern part of the Philippines, you got to get on a, a ferry or a banca and get in six hours to get to this island. This is where you're going to find all the mass swallow angels. Um, uh, a great variety out there uh, of high end uh, fish. And then, so we'll be training 30 divers there. And then we'll be going to Mapanis, as I said to you, northern Samoa to set up a substation. There's 20 divers. Let me explain about these areas, Keith. These are class five municipalities. This is the poorest of the mm. poor. Okay, so you'll get these these divers will be earning luckily how much a month? Come over here. Don't give me that. I got my brother in law giving me hand signals there. Join the party. Fifty dollars. Keith, imagine fifty dollars a month these divers are making in these class five fifty dollars a month for how many hours of work? You're talking whatever they can get out of the you know, it's seven days, you know, these men, the weather's right, but they're not collecting tropical fish. They're collecting spear, spear fishing, food fish. Okay, so they're making $50 a month in a class five uh, municipality. And this is, you know, this is, this, this guts us. When you go into these places and you see that they can't even really feed their fa uh, their, themselves, so they basically just have enough to feed their families. So when we go into these areas, we have to work with the municipalities, uh, the local government, uh, the marine, uh, maritime police. Uh, basically, we always go in with the Bureau of Fisheries. Uh, and we're very blessed that the Bureau of Fisheries backs us in all these net trainings that we're doing. So when we uh, basically class five municipality, uh, you have four classes, that one, two, three, four, five. So the class five is the poorest of the poor. So can you imagine fifty dollars a month? This guy is trying to, you know, make spear fishing. Now in spear fishing, what by letting letting them collect tropical fish, it's a game changer for them because we educate them on how to protect the reefs, what to collect. We give them all the equipment for free: nets, dive masks, suits. If they we assist them with bunkers. A bunk is a boat, uh, compresses, uh, whatever they need. Um, and, and then they go from $50 a month. Now they collect and, and, they, and when they shoot these food fish, basically they're shooting everything and they're taking the breeders off the, off the reefs, these big fish. So we want to keep the big uh, fish in the water, keep breeding, but we have to give them a livelihood. You know, and, and these regions, these logistically areas are sometimes nearly impossible to get to. We get there, okay? One is because uh, there's great value in the fish there, and, and, and it's, it goes hand in hand. So when we train these uh, local guys, they go from $50 a month spear fishing to, to how much? $50 a month. $100 to $200 a week. 
to a hundred and two hundred dollars a week. Wow. Okay, so you're talking a game changer. Can you imagine fifty dollars a month? Now they're making a hundred to two hundred dollars yeah. per week. Okay, you know, look in the United States, at one point two hundred dollars a week was a was you know the the common middle class Joe's salary with taxes out. You know, real estate three hundred, three fifty. You come down to the twos. So it's a really game changer. Changes the life. It changes the community. You know, uh, and also they're not taking the giant Nassau's off the or the adult halibut also. Great, great. They're not taking the the adult fish off the readers. You know, so it's a lot of work, Keith. People don't realize what we're doing here. Okay, and I really we're very grateful that you've put us on your show that we can give a a, a view of what was really is happening on the front line. Again, we're just foot soldiers. Okay. So, um, and then, uh, I was just going to mm-hmm. comment, uh, Chris Meckley from ACA Aquaculture is watching and he says, Barnett supplies so many fish for our industry, such a complex process. He and his team are some of the best in the industry. Well, I greatly appreciate that. And, and Chris has visited us here and, uh, and that's our, that's our young brother down in, in the Tampa area. I think he's down in, yeah, he's, he's in, in Florida area. He's doing a great job uh, also with his mariculture farm there. You know, and, and, and that's the future, you know, education's the future. So being a responsible company, this is what you have to do. You have to be on the front line. You have to give back. The net training is, a, is the greatest blessing. And it's, and it's our responsibility to be responsible as a company. You just can't keep taking. So with Steve, I met Steve back in the 80s in the Philippines. And when I seen what he was doing, uh, you know, I met him in Port of Princess Palawan and he was doing in that training and, and I seen the difficulties he was having, you know, because, you know, basically uh, when your foundation money is, is, you know, high administration salaries, NGOs running around, you know, a lot of fancy pictures, but you know what really trickles down to these poor fishermen, and that's where it gets me disgusted as a private businessman. So we took it on ourselves to do the net trainings privately with our own money, okay, and putting it, you know, uh, you know the, the where our, where we talk is, you know, we, we're putting our money is where we talk back into the poor fishing villages. It makes a great difference. You know, it's a, it's a game changer. And, you know, we love doing it, you know, because, again, education is the greatest gift you can give. Again, I do not blame none of these divers, Keith. These are the most best divers in the world. But if they're not educated, how can we blame them? So it's the little things we can do giving back. You can't blame the men, these divers. Again, these guys are just trying to get a, make a living. These are rural Coastal communities, okay, and the government can go so far. So by us working hand in hand with the government, we're improving the lives of the coastal community throughout the Philippines. And the next step will be Papua New Guinea. And Papua New Guinea, logistically, is probably one of the most uh, difficult places to operate in the world. But again, um, I don't take no for an answer, and it can be done as long as we can get there. Uh, but, you know, Papua New Guinea is a great country. The people are beautiful. Uh, we, again, we work there. Like here in the Philippines, we work with the Bureau of Fisheries. So we work with um, uh, Director Gigona. Okay. He backed us on all our net training. Um, General Esperon, he was the National Security Advisor. The, uh, the President Dorothy, he was the, uh, and he basically is our partner with the Mariculture coral farming. So he's a four star general, the most highly decorated general in the history of the Philippines. He was the chief of staff. He has rich history here in the Philippines and he's green. He wants to do green projects. So but with him, you know, you gotta remember all these different provinces that we go into are operated by, you know, mayors and governors and everything. And, you know, it's, some places are quite difficult to get into because. You know, if they're not educated in the way of, of what we're doing, because everybody is all negative. Because when you get these NGOs running around, everything is negative. It can't, ha- it can't work. 
Because they need the funding to keep coming. They need to have their money keep coming to keep, you know, keep their projects going. We don't. We go in, we train them. They have a livelihood. They're earning. Okay. And then when the mayors see this, they it's a, they know what we're doing is right. Because, for instance, in Lubang Occidental Mindoro, we trained I think 50 divers there. When we went in there, okay, that's a class four municipality or five. Class five municipality. Imagine this, Keith. They're making fifty dollars a month spearfishing. After we went and trained these guys, they're now earning a hundred to two hundred dollars weekly. Okay, in the village there was only one tricycle uh, for the whole village. After we went, after one month of us operating, there was twelve tricycles. Wow. The mayor sees this. He says, "The mayor is like." So the mayor really embraced this. There was Mayor uh, uh, Sanchez. He had a vision, okay? Uh, so we really worked hand in hand with Mayor Sanchez and Lebon, and everything was excellent there. Um, now we're going on the other side of Lebon to Le Up. Uh, we're gonna do a net training with the, the vice mayor just came here about a month ago. Uh, his name? Um, so Le Up is... Uh, uh, an excellent area, and uh, it's on Lebong, Occidental Maduro. It's just another area. Again, class five municipality. We're we'll trained about probably 50 divers there. Um, so, you know, it's nonstop work, you know. So, in, here in the Philippines, working with the Bureau of Fisheries, uh, the, the local Coast Guard, uh, the local uh, the Maritime Police, we, when we do these trainings, Keith, the great thing is everybody gets trained, not just the fishermen. The LGUs attend. So when we do the training, we have five people from the local government. They sit in. Then we have five people from the maritime police. They get the training. The Coast Guard, five people attend from the Coast Guard. And then all the divers that train. Because you have to educate everybody. Because by educating everybody, then everybody knows how it operates. And then what we did, we made a licensing program once we educate, you know, once they do this uh, net training, they get a license that's registered to the Bureau of Fisheries, and then what? And then the boat, what they're working on, it's registered. Basically, there was no um, organization. Uh, so when, when somebody's in the water, you don't know who's fishing in your waters. So now, when the Coast Guard has the binoculars, looks, they can see the registration number on the bata. Then they can they'll, they'll see that registration number. They'll know it's a live tropical fish divers. What divers are on the boat, and we're making you know a, a very good identification uh, for the for the government. Okay, they grabbed it, you know, and 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 supported it. So God bless. It worked out great. So now, in, in the waters where they collect the fish, they can end up identify who they are. That's the most important because you know the here in the Philippines, the coastal waters is the local um, LGUs in charge. The Bureau of Fisheries used to be in charge of the coastal waters, right, Ricky? Uh, the coastal waters? The coastal waters, so yeah. the, the mayor is in charge of the coastal waters. So the Bureau of Fisheries has no logistics on the coastal waters. So if the mayor don't want us to train and we have the backing of the Bureau of Fisheries, we still can't get in there. So logistically, we're like, um, we're jumping through uh, hoops all the time. Most of the time, the mayors uh, are very open and they want the training to be done. But unfortunately, sometimes um, it don't go hey, that way. But the Bureau of Fisheries... Hmm? Go, uh, go ahead and finish. I was going to ask you a couple of questions. Right. The Bureau of Fisheries, uh, we have 110% support. We're directly going to... Before that, was direct at Aziz Perez. I think every six years now, we get a new director of fisheries uh, because you know when the you know the administration changes, they put their own people in. So it's quite difficult for us because when there's a new change, you're like starting at ground zero. Okay, so you have to then go to the new director and you have to you know basically show them what you're doing. It's a logistically a lot of work. I uh... but it has to be done. It has to be done. So here in the Philippines, that covers the you know. All the work we're doing, and then with the Mariculture Coral Farming, we have a coral farm in 
100 islands with a mayor at Celeste. Um, we have a coral farm in Lubang. Uh, we're going to build one in La Uh We uh, in Mapanis. We have a beautiful coral farm in Mapanis with the backing of Mayor uh, Tiano. Uh, uh, that's a great area, this Mapanis. Uh, again, classified municipality. Um, and then when we go into Papua New Guinea, um, we're working with, again, the Minister of Fisheries uh, and the Managing Director of, uh, of, that's the National Fish Authority. So it's a, every country has a different system. So now in Papua New Guinea, they, they, they uh, every, I think, five years works differently. They get contracts there. Um, it's more of a um, English, uh, Australian setup, um, but they got the independence from Australia. The Papua New Guinea people are highly intelligent, um, uh, but again, they need to have, you know, somebody that really wants to invest and educate these coastal communities. They're, they're, they're the same situation as the Philippines. So there we work with, the new minister just came on as a minister uh, of okay. fisheries, is Joe De Wong. He has a great vision. We're going to do a substation in Rabo. Rabu is on the other side of Papua New Guinea. Um, that's R O B, I think, um, U L A? A U L. Oh, A A U L. So uh, now Rabu has a, a hundred mile long reef that the National Geographic came. It's untouched, it's, it's amazing, but again, there's no livelihood. So these people have a class five, um, probably again earning, uh, luckily, you know, $50 a month. So by us going in there to train them to collect tropical fish and do mariculture coral also in, in, in uh, Bravo and do sea cucumber farming, okay, a mariculture sea cucumber. Uh, There's great potential in, uh, in, in Bravo. Um, and, with, and with the new minister, Joe De Wong, uh, we have the full backing. Uh, so it's great when we have ministers and fisheries that really fully back us on what we what we doing again we do it privately we don't ask for no money from the, no fisheries we do this with our own capital okay you know we're not looking for no handouts if they want to uh, help us you know uh, give us logistically or help their communities by giving boats to them it is welcome but you know but we're not looking for that but if they do that the Bureau of Fisheries does that throughout the Philippines now. They're giving bonkers uh, to these uh, uh, poor fishermen, which made a big change. This just started about uh, about over six years ago, right? With uh, first Director Aziz Perez <laughs> and then Director Gona. You know, uh, Keith, I can keep you here for five days, okay? <laughs> you know, it, 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 I'm just telling you, it's a lot. You know, way back in the old days, um, my, I, my ex-partner was Ellen Seagrest, Seagrest Farms. You know, that's where we started building all these stations abroad, uh, you know, with the backing of, uh, of Seagrest and Ellen. Ellen had a vision also, okay? Uh, he's retired, and, and we love him very much. He, 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 believe me, I learned so much from uh, Ellen Seagrest. So we traveled the world together. Uh, and we, you know, and, and put us away. He's a hardworking man. And, and give you instance, in Saudi Arabia, uh, we stayed there. I don't know how many months. We had a sub. We had a station about a hundred miles from Jeddah, and I think in Schwaiba. And uh, we 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 siphoned the tanks. Again, we're we're frontline soldiers. Okay, ain't nothing more. I have a pleasure of putting that hose over my shoulder and and teaching somebody how to siphon the prop away. <laughs> you won't believe it. You know, the little things go far away. Um, and then, um, uh, and back on to Papua, Papua New Guinea, I want to stay on track. Okay? So we've done two net trainings there in the last nine months of operation. I think we trained 70 divers. Um, now, when we train these divers, not all of them stay on, okay? You know, because it's hard work. So, you know, it's so when we put these trainings in, we pray for a 50% keep mm. training, you know, or, or keep collecting fish. 
So in Papua New Guinea, with the next training, it was very successful. And uh, with the substation in Rabul, with the new Minister of Fisheries, uh, Jelka Wong, and we have a new managing director there, Justin Ilawanka. Okay, you know, it's a lot of work these, these two gentlemen have. So we're just looking to work hand in hand. Also, we'll be doing a substation in Manos. Uh, Manos is another area in Papua New Guinea. It's a that, bio, biodiversity hotspot. Yeah, Chris bio, from ACI says yeah, we need a global map to keep up. <laughs> you ain't hey, uh, Barnett, let me ask you a question. So <clears throat> you, you mentioned that these, uh, these folks, you know, um, in these class five municipalities were, uh, you know, getting paid 50 bucks, I guess, a month for, uh, for spear fishing. Uh, w w was there anything else that these folks were doing? Were they actually collecting ornamentals via illegal means like uh, cyanide? Were, were there some practices like that going on in terms of, are the net trainings just really training folks in terms of how to capture ornamentals the right way without uh, chemicals and other like explosive, th those sorts of means? Okay. That was 30 years ago. Okay, the, that was the rant. As we did more and more net training, okay, the cyanide is a thing of the past. Okay, dynamite is the worst. That's the worst destruction. So when we go into class five municipalities, no, they're not collecting tropical fish. They're mainly spear fishing and unfortunately dynamite. Dynamite, hmm. Okay, because they can't. They can't, at least class five municipalities, they don't have the means. One, they don't have the, uh, the, the proper equipment to collect the fish. Two, and how are they going to get the fish to Manila? Okay. Now in the Philippines, it's, uh, they have a very good system in place. You have to have, when you travel with the fish, you have to have. Hey, Ricky, come, come talk. Ricky, I'll explain to you. Okay. Right now, uh... Um, from our provinces, they are collecting uh, tropical fish, and uh, they have to be uh, certified by uh, Bureau of Fisheries. Then, if they are certified divers, they can they can uh, collect and uh, they can travel their fish by plane or by land uh, through the permits given by the Bureau of Fisheries. It's called the land transport permit. So, this land transport permit is very important because. Uh, our company, RBS Fish World, cannot ship these fishes without without this land transport permit. We have to declare it to the Bureau of Fisheries before we can get export document permits. So that's how it goes. So this per, uh, the training is very important so that uh, they will be certified by the Bureau of Fisheries in their provinces to be a certified diver. And what else do they need to get from the local government? Local government will issue, uh, once they are uh, certified by the fisheries, the local government will issue uh, uh, another permit so that they, uh, they to show, to show uh, the fisheries that they are allowed to collect in their province. We got a, um, we, we got a question from um, Brandon Scott Art. Do any locals fight your presence or give you trouble? Um, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that uh, perhaps this uh, question is um, alluding to potentially a black market out there, people collecting fish illegally, no much you guys encroaching on their territories. Does that sort of thing go on? No, uh, in the Philippines, okay, uh, it's, it's every country di works differently. So here in the Philippines, once they, uh, they collect, they're in the water, it, 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 there's no... Um, it's like not village to village. In Papua New Guinea, that's, it's village to village. So you have to go to the chief. You have to, it's, it's more complex. Same thing like in Fiji and Tonga. But here in the Philippines or in Indonesia, they, they don't, it's, you're in the water, you're working. You, you, when you're working in those areas, 99% you, you, of the time, excuse me, you're from that province. Gotcha. Okay, so I understand okay. what you're saying, like pirating, going in different waters and everything. In the Philippines and Indonesia, that it's not like that. Uh, uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, to fish in different areas, it's more complex. It's, um, you have to, 
go to the chief, and those waters you either give a um, uh, um, either there's two ways. We have licensed buyers, okay, in Papua New Guinea that take care of the village, and and they are the ones who get all the fish from the fishermen, and we pay the licensed buyer, and then he's in charge of paying these coast the, the village people, okay, or we pay them if they don't want to uh, dive, uh, or the divers don't want to collect there, and we go in, we pay a royalty fee to the village. So then we bring our own divers in, in our own boats, and we give a royalty fee, mm. and and that will be uh, we give it to the chief, and then you know they 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 uh, share it through the um, the village. It's it's very complex there because. He's right. In Papua New Guinea, village to village, can Steve's been there? Steve's done uh, the training before in Papua New Guinea. Uh, it's village to village, and it can get very um, territorial. Hmm. Territorial, right? And 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 jealousy. Okay. So that's the thing that we're facing in Papua New Guinea. You know, it's um, jealousy, enviousness. You know, it's, it's it's quite difficult. So again, you just have to educate them. They're great people. But, you know, every country, you have different op- obstacles. Papua New Guinea is very tribal. Tribal. I mean, you got 800 languages in Papua New Guinea. And it's only 8 million oh. people. You know, you know, so, you know, it's, it's quite um, uh, challenging, okay? You go one village, they'll speak one language, and you go five miles away, and they get their own, they get their own language. Barnett, so, how does a guy from like the Bronx said, uh, handle that sort of situation with all the different languages and whatnot? How uh, you, you, obviously you're good at what you do, but uh, what's the trick there? The, 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 basically, uh, by being born in America, it's like the melting pot. Okay, so that's what makes our country so great. It's made up of everybody. Okay, it ain't just like one, one uh, of race of one one uh people in america it's it's everybody we're melting we're all one so being on the front line and everything my grandmother taught me you know it's not the color of your skin it's it's, it's what it's the you, we all bleed red so i you have to look past everything how do you get things done it's i don't take no for an answer everything is possible that's my saying okay logistically I, you know, at my age, I should have I should have my head examined because you know, but you know, really, other people would 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 stop. But it's a passion. You don't know when you go into a, a fishing village and you see how these people live, and if you can change people's lives, okay. And again, remember, I'm a businessman too, Keith. So you know, you know, you know. Let's be frank here, okay. We're doing this for business, so you know, we go in, they make money, we make money. It's two-way traffic, okay? Quality. Right, but it's quality, and it's giving back. That's the difference. Other people just take, take, take. That's the wrong attitude, okay? You have to be sustainable. I guess that's the that's the word of the 21st century now. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 but we were born with that in our bloods way back before anything ever came in. Look at Steve, the sacrifice Steve's done with his whole life. In the past probably 40 years doing all the net training here in the Philippines and every other place in the world. You know, we're very fortunate we have a great team. Look, Thomas Wood came over from England, okay, Manchester. He's seen what we're doing with the net training. He's seen the passion. Oh, said he goes, I ain't going back. I want to stay. You know, you, 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 build, you build a team of soldiers. These, these are volunteer soldiers. This is not enlisted. This is not drafted. <laughs> It's got to be in your blood, okay? You have to pick the right people also, you know? And I'm very blessed to have a family of, uh, you know, my family's Filipino family. So once you're married to a Filipino, uh, you know, you got a great family. And here in the Philippines, it's Catholic. Uh, it's a Catholic country. And uh, it's, a, it's and, and I'm, you know, like I said, again, they're beautiful people. Uh, I'm Jewish, okay, by birth. Okay, but again, God's God. You, can, you know, I don't care where you at. You can pray anywhere. So you know, that's my philosophy. Okay, um, 
Uh, so here in the Philippines, by having married my wife and having such a, oh my God, uh, army of, uh, uh, of a family. We have what? I think I got 30 nieces and Whoa. nephews. Okay. <laughs> I have uh, six, six brothers, uh, brother-in-laws. I call them brothers. Uh, my wife is my, 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 she's everything. I mean, without my wife, nothing could have ever happened. Keith, bottom line. Okay. I, I dragged this girl from, she was working for the largest uh, um, oil company here in Asia, uh, Oriental Petroleum. This girl was a, uh, was a forensic accountant. She was offered six figures in the United States to go work for American Express. And I asked her, can you just stay with me and we'll build something beautiful together? You know, and, and the sacrifice, imagine bringing her to Eritrea. When we went to Eritrea, that was the end of uh, the war that they had with Ethiopia, I think it was 30 years. They were annexed. Now, can you imagine your country being annexed? It's basically almost like what's happening in Russia and uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So by, by being annexed, you, you, they take the country away. So Ethiopia ran at a tree. So when they finally got their independence back, I said to myself, wow, 30 years at war, I go, Nobody's fished these waters, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, really, I'm a businessman. So when I went to the uh, embassy in, in, in Washington and I spoke with the ambassador of Eritrea, he looked at me like I was crazy. He says, you, do, you want to do what? Because there's no infrastructure. The country's completely destroyed. We went, okay? I think three weeks after they signed independence, when we got there, tanks in the street, you know, unfortunately, they didn't bury the, you know, they didn't bury the, the soldiers. They're in, still in Foxhole. It was, the infrastructure, it was not there. To get a telephone call out took me six hours. To get a fax took six hours. Wow. The banking system was, but then the when I went there and I seen the people on the water, you know, they had no, they have nothing, you know, so there was a great thing that everybody said it would be impossible to do. When I heard that impossible, oh, I love that <laughs> word. I said, no, no, it's a truth key. So Eritrea, if you look at it, Masala to Asmara, Asmara is the capital. It's The road was built by the Italians. So it went up and back and forth up. It's like 7,000 feet above sea level. Everybody says it would be impossible to do. We got it done. We operated excellent for six years there. Then this is shipment. You know what's climbing up that mountain in the fog? I mean, you can't even, there was no guardrails. I'm telling you right now, it was nuts. At one time we were going down the mountain and it was fog and the driver, I noticed he had no, you know, some people have no, no. night vision. He, could, he was blind as a bat. So he's looking at the road and to make these turns, if you go over, you're, you're done. You're gonna fall 5,000, right? So, out the Philippine divers got so nervous they jumped out the window of the bus. Okay, jumped out. Okay, it was nuts. So um, that's just give you some you know little things of what we've done through the past years and everything. Um, Steve, what he's done on the front line, he can tell you. Uh, you know, my God, all the trainings he's done um, in in the Philippines. What I, I love about Steve is his dedication. On, on really going into the, into these areas that you know have no electric. I mean, Steve is a real front line soldier. When I mean front line soldiers, but we're all front line soldiers. You know, we're foot soldiers. Okay, we're no better than anybody. Okay, we're just trying to give a sustainable livelihood to the coastal community. Do a better job. We we have a saying here: we're better than the best. Okay. You got to push the bar. General Esperon always told me, push the bar so high that nobody can touch you. And guess what? Okay, I I live by his words. We're pushing it as far as as high as we can. You know, so these investments are big money too. You know, it's very stressful there. You know, because Papua New Guinea is probably the most expensive place on the planet to operate. And I'm not joking. Okay. You know, it, it can bleed you out if you don't know what you're doing. Okay. And, it, and logistically, when COVID came, then the airlines stopped flying. Okay. You know what kind of stress we're having there? I mean, I think 
we had to pay rent there um, for for one year. The, the the company was kind to us. I think the first year COVID, they didn't charge us because we didn't set up yet. Okay, we just had all the equipment in the building. But then the second year came, they said, well, you know, you got to pay, but we couldn't operate. So you can imagine a hundred thousand dollars in rent with no with no operation going on. You know, you know, it, it, it's um, it's so you know, th th there's so much money go around, and you know, we don't have deep pockets. You know, it's because we we give back to the to the people. Okay, it ain't it ain't the uh, uh, it's nice to make money. Don't get me wrong. But it's expensive to keep marching down the road. But again, the gratitude that you get from this and seeing you changing people's lives in these poor coastal communities is priceless. You can't put a you can't put a, a number figure on this, okay? When you get a guy that's making fifty dollars a month spare fishing, that's if he can get in the water, okay? Yeah. Okay. Can you imagine this? I'll give you an example. You know the mustard tang? The mustard tank, scientifically. Uh, um, okay. They're getting paid per kilo $2. $2 a kilo, and they would have to spare fish about 30 pieces. Wow. 30 pieces. We pay for one live mustard tank. Uh, $6. $6. So we pay for one life. I'm just giving you, now let's yeah. go into the- A lot less work. Fish. So they're, they're spare fishing 30, they kill 30 mustard tanks. They get $2 a kilo. We go into that village. We pay them not to spare fish them, they collect them live. So that 30 pieces that are getting paid $2 for, we're paying for one piece live, $6. You understand what kind of game changer this is? Yeah. So in the current trade, we can give such a livelihood by educating them. You know, don't get me wrong, spare fishing they they can do, but they can't earn the money they're earning on the tropical fish compared to spare fishing. You're talking, it's ridiculous. It's what a hundred, a hundred eight dollars for thirty. Yeah. yeah. So so for thirty pieces of the mustard tang, they would collect, for instance, like maybe in two days. They get $180. Now, if they spare fish them, the 30 pieces, and sell them on the market, they get $2. You understand the value difference here, okay? So, by you so when that mayor sees this, you have to educate everybody. You got to educate the whole fishery sector. Because, unfortunately, you can't blame nobody, Keith, if they're not educated. So, you got to go on the front line, and you got to educate the people, you know? Um, uh, Steve, do you want to jump in at all? I'll sure. just jump you want to jump in? Quick, a quick hey, point. Come, come 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 uh, I love what people say about you. Um, if they pay water in space, we'd be oh. there next week. It's a done another talk. I know, that's what I'm <laughs> saying. They always say about by now when they come here, if they found water in space, by now be there next week looking for the fish in it. So you get what he said there, Keith? That's my English my man. Translate. Uh... Translate. <laughs> if there was water in space, okay, you know, I guess that's that Elon Musk guy, right? That we would be there. We would be there <laughs> okay, next week, yeah, next week for the looking for the fish. Okay. Gotcha. You know, but the bottom line is educating them and giving them the right tools. Okay. Even if they're Martians. Right. Even if Martians, right? Yeah. We're friendly with Martians. <laughs> Uh, and, and educating them, and giving them the right tools, and, and giving them the support, okay? That's the key, okay? You know, because again, everybody can make money, okay? But again, to be sustainable, this is the, the greatest practice, educating them. Again, this is a great example. 30 mustard tanks, $2, they get paid a kilo, and we're paying them for one piece, $6. They get $180 compared to $2. Okay, you know, you, you know, you, you're talking. Can you imagine? So this poor guy that's making fifty dollars a month, collecting whatever he can, blasting up the reef. Okay, killing the big breeders. Okay, mm. now we educate them, collecting the ornamental fish, protecting the reef, showing them how to collect the fish, 
giving them the nets, giving them the equipment, investing into the community, setting up substations so they don't have to run them in all. So basically when we do substations, the divers come in with the fish, they bring us the fish, we pay, we pay for them manila price in the province, okay, which is unheard of. Then we're the ones who condition the fish in the, in the field, and then we bring the fish down to our own facilities. See, Ellen Segrist taught me a very, the most valuable thing I have I taught in my life. You have to foresee the future. And then when I, I was very young with Ellen, and I looked at him, I said, foresee, he always said that to me, Bonnet, you have to foresee. Now, Ellen was the best businessman I ever met in my life. He, he said, foresee the future, and it's the God truth key. You know, there's no crystal ball. I'm just letting you know, okay? By foreseeing the future as a businessman, you have to look in the, look what can happen, and you have to prepare. A lot of people just sling it from the hip. They think, oh, you know, I'm going to open up an aquarium store, you know, because I love fish and everything. And then next next year, when you go to the guy, he calls himself a fish <clears throat> expert. It just blows my mind, okay? You know, so by foreseeing the future is really you have to look, and you have to you have to really project what can happen. And, you know, and, and that was a very, the most valuable lesson I learned from Ellen Segrist, to see the future. And I, and I wish everybody on the planet can have the same view, okay? Because then at least nothing, in, nothing in ever is 100% and nothing will ever be perfect. We're only human. But if we can prepare ourselves and foresee what's ahead of us, it'll be a better place we live, okay? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. So, um, I mean, let me uh, let me ask you a question. You know, so basically, these uh, divers now are are being uh, incentivized to um, you know catch the ornamental fish via the nets versus uh, spear fishing. Correct? Can I assume that that's going to just help the populations of these these fish be more sustainable in in the long run? Right? I mean, if if they're not going to be getting spear fished. I'm assuming you have to get a lot more in terms of uh, spear fishing, right? You're talking about that. This has got to be helping the, um, you know, the reefs in terms of making them more sustainable over the long run, right? Well, we have an example in Mexico where seven fish collectors were stopped uh, for whatever reason, right? The industry was stopped there. And so, of course, they do what they, they go to what they do, which is spear fishing and food fishing. And the catch books reveal six tons of, of catch per diver. So instead of catching sustainable tropical fish that went to the airports in a three-quarter ton van, they caught commercial fish that went to market in five-ton trucks. The conversion was ridiculous. Killing fish, adult fish, broodstock fish for a living is a poor conversion. It's nothing compared to tropical fish, which are collected and sold at an environmentally ex inexpensive timing, right? They're ready for market rather quickly. Like the mustard tang Barnett was talking about. They're ready for market in like seven or eight months. And they're worth so much more than, a, than the brood stock. It's, we've got it all reversed. People got to rethink environmentalism and and, and the way they regard the aquarium trade, it's a much better conversion of the resource if it's done right. Of course, if it's done with cyanide, it, it, you know, the whole thing falls apart. But if you do it sustainably with nets, the larvae, the eggs, everything passes through the net and you don't destroy anything. So uh, Barnett seems to be the only businessman that got it, mm. right? And picked up on it and ran with it. And it continues to evolve you know, in, a, in an exponential manner while everybody else is staying behind and not involving in field policy, in how to handle the fish right. You know, it's not just collecting, of course, it's handling as well. And so you kind of got to put the whole package together to produce a superior product. And it's great not to have a lot of competition to do that, but of course other exporters are welcome to engage if they want. And then it's a trickle down effect. Because when we go into these villages, okay, when we train, we're training the other exporters, diapers. Yeah. Mm. And I have no problem with that. For free. Right, for free. <laughs> right. Because I have no problem with that. Because the worst 
word in the world in the private business is being regulated. Okay, so that's why we're on the forefront and educating and doing it right. Okay, this is the worst thing you could be is regulating. Okay, because when they put the regulations in, most of the time they don't even know what they're regulating. They're just signing documents. Regulating okay? ideas. And then right, regulating ideas. Okay? Or, or ban everything. And then, or ban everything because they don't. Yeah. They, they have no idea they what they're doing. They don't understand it. They need to get in tune with the front line poor people. That's the problem with the world. These politicians got to open up their effing brain and eyes, okay, and give back and feed and help. That's the bottom line. I hate to get over uh, emotional about it. It ain't nothing difficult. Okay, it ain't. It's just doing it right. And they all can do it. Really, they can do it if they want. But unfortunately, some countries and everything, they think by having the people down, they'll always you know, have to come to them. Okay, that's the wrong way. You know, exploitation isn't even intelligent. It doesn't involve a diver getting better. It doesn't make your fish handle better. It doesn't make your fish decompress. You're still catching fish with cyanide, which is illegal and immoral and unethical. And it ruins the image of the whole industry. Why support something like that? Right. And on, on top of this, Keith, okay, going back to the methods of what they're doing now, okay, um, uh, the cyanide is... is here in the Philippines, I, how much? How much? Now you say click by Two three percent. Two three percent. We really, yeah, two three percent in the Philippines. We really wiped it out with all the training, Steve in the front line, and then what? What? RBS pushing the net training, okay, and educating, okay. It's just getting them the proper equipment. You gotta remember, if they're coming down from the field, they don't know how to hold the fish. You could have the best net caught fish in the world. But if they don't know how to handle the fish, you know, they'll, they'll, turn, in, they'll turn into crap, just like food fish. If they don't have a, the proper ice, then all that fish, will be, they'll waste half the fish because they can't it'll be spoilage. So that's the biggest problem in the a third world country. The food industry is ice, okay? And aquarium fish is handling. And that's where we come in and training them how to handle the fish properly. And that's what these net trainings are so valuable. You can go to YouTube and we put up some of our net trainings, Kate. Raw, it's just raw. Some, we, we had a professional company come in to do the document and everything. But you'll see how we, the three-day classroom and the three-day open water. These divers are excellent divers. They ain't like we're training somebody who's never collected before. It's just they just didn't have the opportunity to be trained properly. That's all. And that's what we're doing. We're giving a, a, a sustainable livelihood and training of how to handle the fish, collect the fish. Most important, decompression. Okay? Decompression themselves. Train them how deep they can dive. You know, it's, it's and then with the, with the Bureau of Fisheries and the Maritime Police and the, and the local, and the LGU, everybody's being trained so everybody now knows that you know this is this is and, and believe it or not once they see how well these divers are earning then, then they say hey can my family be trained <laughs> okay it's, it, but it's just really you know educating and so it is getting into these areas and educating the people you know they see can you only imagine again two dollars for a kilo of gem yeah, that's amazing not gem that well, that would be quite a deal, <laughs> right? My mind's on Madagascar. That's what a gem tank there. costs, two bucks? Wow. <laughs> no, 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 no. A kilo. A yeah, kilo. it's worth two bucks. Yeah, that would be, that'd be horrifying. <laughs> no, but believe it or not, who knows in Madagascar? Probably have that spare fishing them because, you know, Madagascar is another whole different area. Um, same thing, logistically, the roads are, you know, really rough and everything. But we're doing a great job in Madagascar. I mean, we have a shipment that just came in um, this week. Uh, I think came in on Sunday. Imagine it was by mistake. Uh, the airlines left it in uh, uh, Turkey. Turkish Airlines left it in, uh, in Turkey for over 24 hours, 
and the fish came in 24 hours late, okay? And we had, I think, not even a 1% DOA. Wow. You, know, you know, you know, that's, you know, that's a, that's, that's a great blessing there. Um, then we have another shipment coming in Madagascar this Sunday to New York. Um, uh, you know, we, it's a lot of work. You know, it's just a lot of work. You know, you can only imagine running five stations and, and having and logistically setting up all the airlines and, and, and it's just, you know, sometimes, uh, <laughs> I think I'm a robot. So you got a couple of requests from the viewers. Jake Sky is asking, uh, ask Barnett if they are planning to build a station at the country of um, Myanmar. And then Maui TV is more stations here in the Philippines, please. Okay. Myanmar, we're building a facility starting next week. There you go. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, and they'll be all documented. So we're putting up, we bought uh, uh, my partner, okay, basically, uh, my partner in Myanmar, he's got, he's doing the whole investment. We do the manpower and we do the marketing. So it's like, you know, and, and we bring all the technology. <laughs> so we have a very good partnership there. So Myanmar, well, we got an oceanfront property. It was a seafood restaurant for 30 years. Uh, I think something like a thousand square meters. So we knocked down the building. We're putting up a new steel structure, uh, modular. It'll take about two weeks to put up. And then we're bringing all the equipment in. Uh, and Myanmar will be doing, um, uh, it's all Indian Ocean fish. We'll be doing Mariculture corals uh, and also uh, freshwater fish, Myanmar. Uh, so that's very exciting, Myanmar. Because all the freshwater fish from Myanmar goes to Singapore farmers. So now they'll be able to get Myanmar direct, never before. Okay, so that's quite exciting. Um, of what's going to happen in Myanmar. But, you know, going back to Papua New Guinea, okay, let's bounce back to Papua New Guinea. There, um, the, 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 the fish that we're finding, that's, imagine Papua New Guinea, you get three seas. You got the Coral Sea, you got the Bismarck Sea, and you got the Solomon Island Sea. What country do you know has three seas? The Philippines. The Philippines? The Philippines. <laughs> yeah. Indian Ocean, <laughs> Pacific, right? This is called the China Sea, the Pacific on the other side, and then the uh, oh, what's the Sulu Sea? The Sulu. Okay, Philippines got three seas. Okay, okay, but Papua New Guinea's got three seas that really hasn't ever been. And uh, one of them is the Coral Sea. The Coral Sea, which is already incredible. The Solomon Sea is also right. incredible. It's it's Papua New Guinea is just you know again Mr. logistically to get in certain these areas, it's um it's 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 hard. You know, it's it's because I told you the it's the most expensive place on the planet Earth to operate. I don't know, you know, it's it's it, you know you got a lot of mining going on in Papua New Guinea, and natural gas. Um, the best coffee in the world comes from Papua New Guinea, and then you got uh, the best cocoa. Okay, comes from Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is probably the, it's the last frontier, and as far as agriculture, if it's done right can feed all of Asia, okay? No joke, Keith, okay? Just the, just rice, and, right? We, I think we're, we're investing in the rice farming there. Um, we're very excited. Uh, we work in Papua New Guinea. Uh, we're very blessed. Uh, the ambassador uh, of the Philippines uh, in Papua New Guinea, his name is Ambassador Tiano. He's been there. He's been the ambassador, I think, 20 years there. He's done more for, uh, I never met, uh, ambassador as great as this man. I deal with a lot of ambassadors all over the world, like in Eritrea. Ambassador Hodak, he was the American amb ambassador. I'm like almost like um, uh, a front line, you know, you have to, you know, talk to all these uh, political people. And, you know, in, in the beginning, I'm just a fish guy, you know, so it's quite difficult when you have to. I'm the, by the way, I'm the public relations officer for the Philippine Tropical Fish Association. So here I have to lobby uh, the Senate and Congress, and you have to educate them what we're doing. Again, nobody, they don't know. So unless you lobby in this. Oh, and, and I was very blessed by um, Director Gagona. Okay, he made me uh, a warden uh, for the Bureau of Fisheries. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Be far. Okay. So. 
you know, so if any illegal activity is happening and everything, we work hand in hand with BFAR and we notify uh, the director uh, direct to make sure that everything's done legally. You know, uh, you know, it's it's again, um, it's hard work. You know, uh, and then there's an the honor of uh, doing the work for all fisheries in whatever country uh, we, we we put our feet in. Um, but again, going back to Papua New Guinea, um, uh, I think uh, there was a company prior there that tried to do it and everything, um, and it, it didn't work out. Uh, it, it was crazy money. I think they got Steve was there on that. Uh, when uh, the NGO is trying to do business, it's kind of laughable since most of them cannot run a donut shop, much less understand the intricacies of running an export station. You know, it's not that easy to do the tropical fish industry. And environmental people often get kind of greedy and think, hey, we can grab that for ourselves. And they do. And they fail 100% of the time. Absolute uh, failure all the time. And NGOs have tried to do this for the last two decades to try and uh, jump into the industry. If you're going to get into the business, be a businessman with a heart, with ethics, with compassion, and do it right. But if you're a nonprofit organization pretending to care about the environment, you've got to stay in your lane and do that. Unfortunately, a lot of them behave like government people, and they're not very efficient. They're not very good. I mean, they sell the keywords, you know, save the coral reef, save the ocean, but they don't know how to do it. Businessmen are actually on the ground. They're in the field. They're, they're with the divers. They're in the water, in the, in, in, with the, in the boat. So it's real. So when you affect changes at the village level, they actually have a chance to stick and, and, to, and to spread. Look how much the RBS thing has gone viral is displaced the cyanide industry almost single-handedly yeah. because other exporters don't do this they don't they don't train in the field they don't put the nets in the field in fact if they get nets they try and make money off of it they're always trying to make money but yeah. they don't know when to like be cool and when to make money right i mean you can't just grab it stuff all the time if you grab it a cow to get milk it'll run away <laughs> so you gotta show a little bit more you know a little bit more consideration. I give you an example. We give all the nets for free to all the divers, our divers. Okay. Now we start finding people lining up in the morning, not lining up, but you know, they showing up at our facility. They do that. Okay. And we're like going, now we have that. We, we have our, our competitors sending, sending their, the, the, their divers, wives, to our facility to get nets. Okay. Again, we have no problem, okay, because we give the netting away for free in the Philippines to our divers. We don't charge. And then, then believe it or not, we've sent nets, my God, now to um, uh, my God, Tonga, uh, Fiji, um, uh, Tahiti, uh, my God, any other country? Well, Papua, well, we, well, well everywhere, everywhere you go. Everywhere. But we have other exporters in different countries contacting us for nets because we have enough nets, my God, for um, 30,000 divers, okay? So, uh, we, we, you know, it, and it's very hard to get this netting because you just can't buy it. You have to buy a run of it. So first you have to find a company that can make the small eye, have the fine monofilament, and, and how to travel around. Before we were getting it out of Japan, then when that horrible earthquake hit there, it, it, it knocked out the company. So then we found another company that can make the netting. And, but you, they told us, if you want it, you know, we're not just going to run, make a run for like two, three hundred dives. You have to buy, you know, when I found out it was for 30,000 dives, Steve. My God, I, I, I was like, you, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, it's like, you know, my wife's a financial analyst. I go off to her. And she's looking at me and saying, you're buying nets for 30,000 divers? She said, Dada. She calls me Dada. Dada. We only have like maybe three, 400 divers. And I'm like, I'm going, well, that's the only way we can get the net. Because they won't make anything less. Wow. So then 
we, you know, we, we bought enough netting to supply the world <laughs> 10 times over. But so, uh, hey. l- all right, let me ask you guys a couple of questions. Sir. I think we've been kind of like, uh, you know, touching these, uh, these subjects, but, uh, you mentioned, uh, Barnett COVID and, uh, <laughs> when that hit. So, you know, fish prices here in the U.S. have gone up a lot since the start of COVID. And I know, like, you know, the, the cost of gasoline, the price of freight has gone up a lot. And, um, you know, the uh, the whole uh, Hawaiian thing being shut down, I know that's got a lot to do with in terms of the uh, the price increases. But what what else is going on that, uh, you know, we should be aware of as, like, you know, the um, hobbyists in terms of fish prices? And where, where is the future of that heading? Hey, the... The, the problem with the pricing of the fish pricing is not that we increased, is the airline's freight went nuts. 300% increase on the airlines. Okay? So when everybody jumped on the bandwagon of taking advantage, mm. they really took advantage. Okay? I mean, horrifyingly. Okay? I mean, you know, if you see everything across the board, so naturally, again, the 1% gets fatter and, and us middle class people, you know, have to work hard, yeah. you know, you know, and believe me, we fight every day with the, you know, with the airlines staying on top of them and staying on top of them, you know, it's starting somewhat to level down, but still, it's still, it's, it's still, um, almost now double the price. It's, it's insane. Oh yeah. For instance, yeah, it, it's beyond insane. You see, yeah, I remember, you know, can you imagine when you have an investment like in Papua New Guinea and I got and I killed myself logistically to get the freight? That's the only reason I invested there because I, if you can't get the fish out, you can't invest. Bottom line, I, I'm being frank. So after I get logistically everything done properly, then COVID came in and then Philippine Airlines stopped flying to Papua New Guinea. So Air New Guinea has been a blessing to us. Let me a blessing. They they are probably one of the best run uh, operations in the airlines I've ever seen. Because I'm I'm on the front line. I, I make all the bookings for many different airlines. So Air New Guinea, their staff are excellent. They I mean just just amazing, amazing. Uh, so without Air New Guinea, we couldn't get the fish out of Papua New Guinea. So Air New Guinea goes to Brisbane, and then we can get it out out of Brisbane on Qantas, and then. And to Singapore and Singapore Airlines and to uh, uh, Hong Kong and Cathay. But logistically, it's anybody else would be a nightmare because you have to have brokers there knowing how to, how to move on negotiation. Believe me, keep people would run away. Okay. I ain't lying to you. It's that difficult. Okay. With Philippine Airlines, I had direct link. It would go from uh, uh, Palm. To Manila, and then out everywhere, you know, and, you know. But then they stopped. They just started flying. But the problem is now, uh, the the only blessing we did had during this COVID, we were part of the essentials. Okay, gotcha. and a lot of people. Let me explain, Keith. A lot of people got crippled during this. Okay, and when I seen it, you know, like everybody else, when they woke up, you know quarantine, everything's shut down. You know, my God, you know, you couldn't watch the news, you have a panic attack. I mean, the news is just, just gross. They, you know, some of these news channels should be, you know, really, I don't want to even tell you what should happen to them, okay? But you know, fear is not the way to, to, to do things. You have to, you know, do things properly. So, so um, that was the biggest thing. So. We're, we were lucky our industry was put into essentials. You know, the dogs, the cats, and the fish. They have to, you know, they have to be fed. So we were part of We were in part of essentials. This industry was been done, finished. So we still were able to get out. Now the airlines, okay, uh, a lot of them had a file bankruptcy and re, restructure, most of them. So when they did the restructuring, they lost about probably... Uh, 20 to 30 percent of their f- the fleet they had to surrender or sell off their planes mm. so we were getting we were getting space on the airlines during the uh, the worst part of COVID. now that the industry's come back you know, travel and everything 
it's crazy. I'll give you an example. When it was normal times, how the how the industry goes on the airlines, it's seventy percent passengers, thirty percent cargo. So that's when it was normal times. So you can get space. Now, when COVID came in, there was no passengers, so we had all the space we wanted. But the freight rate, they were just they just they, you know, unfortunately, everybody took advantage. I mean, and nobody see there where the government should have came in, they should have jumped in and 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 regulate. And I hate to say that word regulate, but when you monopolize and you destroy people's lives, that's the, the responsibility of a government. They have to look in, look, look at that. Okay, which didn't happen. So the, the again, the one percent got fatter and fatter. That they're uh, horrible. So now when it came back, that 70, 30 percent is now 100 percent, they call it tax, tax load. So the planes are 100 percent almost with passengers now. You wouldn't believe it now that, the, you know, the people, you know, you think after them locking us up for two years uh, and, and, and quarantine, like, you know, that really a lot of people got mental problems from this shit. Excuse my language, okay? No, really, it's terrible, okay? You know, so now that the airlines is back and everybody's flying, the problem is now we can't get space. Can you imagine this? Because the, the planes pack slow, so it's always passenger and luggage goes first. So they can't get the fish on the plane. So from 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 logistically when it first hit, we were we were blessed because we're part of essentials, but a lot the problem was getting the fish from the province, okay? You had to have a special permit to travel. You didn't have that permit. They weren't allowing the fish to come down. So so even then some of these guys that weren't educated, I'll give you an example, Keith, and the province, well, they say, oh, this ain't food fish. This is tropical fish. But, we're, but we would show them with part of Central's. They still would, you know, would try to stop us from traveling. You don't know logistically and politically. It's just it was just it was like um, it was like like almost uh, that um, like a platonic two steps. Take two steps forward, take a step backward. Night and day, it didn't stop. Um, so now with the airlines, the biggest problem is they don't have enough planes because they downsize. Mm. And God bless the airlines are coming back. But they need to have more, more, more planes now, and, and increase their fleet. Now they're, 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 some of these airlines are coming back making tremendous gains. Have you seen, like uh, Turkish Airlines, and uh, you know you just just read the, the airlines news. I mean, the, in, in one quarter they're making you know crazy money. God bless, thank God. But the problem is, you know, now will that freight rate ever? get back to where it is because they're so they're, they're now making so much money they're fat cats like going fat cats and then with the you know the fuel increase also that didn't help so what happens is the freight's so high now and then now they come with a fuel surcharge so it's like so they they, they basically they they run you over back up and run you over again <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know so you know you know and it's and again, it, it, it's brutal, but, um, you know, you just... Do you, I mean, do you uh, look at a crystal ball there and try to predict what's going to happen in the next couple of years? Do you have a, uh, a sense of where this thing's going to be going? Or is it, are we got to... Is it like the new normal in terms of these freight prices? Um, no, 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 no. We can't accept that. I'm, as a businessman and frontline, we, we would not... We can't... They are coming down in certain sectors. They are. They're coming down in certain sectors, you know. Yeah, as long as the fuel will. Is, right. Is, is the fuel, it's really, we're tied yeah. into the fuel. So, you know, unfortunately, with the, the problem with the Russia and Ukraine, you know, uh, uh, and then, you know, you can remember that OPEC, and then they call OPEC plus and all this shit. You know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's that's the problem, you know. Um, uh, they have to stabilize. They can't just keep on 
this crazy uh, uh, the the prices because it don't they don't have to be like that. They can bring it down. Uh, it's just how they. We're basically we're being you know it's hard to say majority's being controlled by the the one percent and 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 so the, as far as the fuel, they'll stabilize. I, I feel uh, um, it'll it's starting to slowly gradually um, uh, come down some of the rates. Uh, like into L.A., uh, they've gotten better the freight rate, um, but not to where it was. I think. Uh, 150%. Still 150 percent higher, but it's better than yeah. it's better yeah, than Yeah, that's that's uh that's it's easing the blow a little bit. Right, but you got to look at that. That's within what six months or a year? No, yes. two years. It went up 300 percent, and this last um, three, to four months. three to four months, it's now down 150. Right, promising. The, Right, you know, so you know that's why the the hobbyists keep your passion, okay? Support the hobby, you know. Go to the stores, that brick and mortar stores, the mom and pop, you know, the ones that you know. Uh, we have to support ourselves as a hobby, and 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 and, and our industry is very important. So you know. Uh, Everything has changed, like online buying. As me as a hobbyist, and I'm a hobbyist at heart, okay? I started doing this when I was nine years old. My father gave me my first aquarium when I was nine, and that was it. I, I mean, that I, I, I love. I never, uh, I, I had 30 aquariums, uh, three tiers, three rows at an iron bar, and my bedroom at the age of 12, Jeez. okay? I <laughs> I couldn't sleep if I didn't hear. <laughs> I, did, I couldn't fall asleep. Okay, no joke. That's my 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 antidote to sleeping here. <laughs> the bubbles. So so you know the bottom line is you know, for me, I have to see the fish. My enjoyment is going into those aquarium stores. I would do a route. I would go at least sometimes I go ten stores in one day. Just try, you know, and see them all, and then go back. I'd see all the fish first, okay? You know, but, you know, Americans, we're impulsive buyers, you know? You know, so sometimes you see it, and you have to have it. Uh, you know, and, and, and my passion is um, I, I love the aquarium trade. You like here, we have aquarium here, okay? Uh, you know, and th this, is, this is my baby. Uh, and another thing how we educate keep is we set up aquariums and uh, government and agencies like you know uh, you know because what happens is let me explain what these uh, uh, NGOs and these private foundations do they scare the crap out of the fisheries they go oh the aquarium trade these fish don't live past you know you know what that's what uh, I'm looking at it in Hawaii. That's exactly what she did. Ninety percent of them die within this period of time or this period of time, just freaking everybody out, freaking the fisheries who, who, out. Who did that? Homburger, the, Homburger did the that. one who's fighting the Hawaiian fish. That that right. was a big that was that that was a big reason why they uh, were successful in having a ban in Hawaii. Right. Yeah, she was the one that brought the lawsuits. Right. So see see what you, what you, by being on the forefront and what everybody in the United States should do. The wholesalers, I mean this now, and they got to listen, okay, even the pet stores. Education is the forefront. Donate aquarium to, the, to a public school. Do the maintenance for free. Educate the children. Go into your uh, senator or, or congressman. Put a tank in there. Set it up, okay? Do the maintenance. Educate them because they're not, these people, they don't know. But if they see it, okay, like here in the Bureau of Fisheries and the, and the agriculture, okay, we put aquariums in because, you know, because what they were telling the, the director, oh, the marine aquarium fish after 10 days, they all die, you know. And so, you know, I, I'm like, you know, and this is, the, this is what they go off. So I said, you know, I'm putting an aquarium in. And that's, I told you, we got to put an aquarium everywhere. No, no, 
No joking, okay? So we put the aquarium in the Bureau of Fisheries, okay? And the minute you get off the elevator, that's the first thing you see. Now that the, now the director sees that he has fish in that aquarium that's living over six years. So when that person comes and goes, oh, they don't live past 10 days, okay? They can't even enter his office no more, okay? Because they're lying. Because they're lying. <laughs> so that's what we need to do. If anybody's listening, please, go on the offense. Set up aquariums. Donate. Put aquarium in, okay? And, you, and, 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 and educate the schools, educate the government, okay? And, sh and, you know, that's what we do here. And that's what we have to do Amanda, everywhere. Amanda Meckler okay? from ACI said we had some officials from Tallahassee down, and Chris had them fragging coral laugh out loud. Learn by, learn, learn by doing, great. right? Right, exactly. But you have to take a step more, okay? You have to donate. You got to put aquarium in it. And in the schools, or or in the, or the mayor's office, or in the governor's office, okay, you know, especially the governor, because they sign bills like this with their <laughs> eyes closed. You know, what I mean? <laughs> you know, no joke. You know, it's amazing when you get a letter from somebody, and you go, and you read it, and you go, no, they couldn't write this letter. And then you ask them, were you the author of this letter, or you just signed it? And then they'll say, well, I hope I didn't insult you. I just signed it, and they go, oh my god, they didn't even read what they signed. You know, it's like, he, you can't even imagine, okay? You can't even imagine what it's like being on the front line, okay? But that's what we can give back, and hopefully this will go out. And again, offense, the best offense the will, best defense is the, be the, the is best good defense offense. is the greatest yeah. offense, okay? Look at New England Patriots, Tom Brady. Okay, you know, you know, you got to look. At, it's the best, and 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 guess what? We if we don't do it, shame on us. Simple and plain, because everything's in our hands. We control our own destiny. Okay, so we got you know just just do it. You know what, what they say? Oh, just do That's it. That's Nike. Nike right? Just do it. Okay, great. Right. It's simple, but it has to be done. It has to be done. You know, lobbying and everything. You've got to put the aquarium in. These wholesalers got to step up to the plate everywhere in the world, especially in the United States. I, I love you know all the wholesalers and everything, but they have you know you know don't don't wait to the eleventh hour, okay? Do not wait to the eleventh hour. Go on the offense. Educate. Put aquarium in. The schools. We did this in upstate. When I was back in the United States, we had we had a we had an aquarium in the public, the junior, you know, the elementary school. Everywhere Sammy went, I made sure there was an aquarium. Okay, we put them in and we educated the kids. And we so now, can you imagine that some of these kids? They don't even know where Fiji is or the Philippines and what comes. It's it's priceless education you give them. That's okay? scary. That's scary. You no, know, it is scary. It is scary. And what I believe, Keith, but the, really the best thing that can happen is um, uh, more of um, when they do the exchange exchange student. We had a we had a student came from uh, uh, up in York part of the neighborhood, um, University of of um, Maine. Ah. Okay. And they did an exchange student with us. They sent, they sent him here to uh, about three months. He stayed during the net training, okay? Uh, uh, and he was in the field, working in the field with Steve uh, at the substations, okay? Uh, he graduated from uh, Maine, University of Maine. That's, I think, the top marine science in the United States. Am I, I think it's a top school for that, yeah. Great. Right? Now he's working for Seagrass Farms. Wow. Okay, so you know, it's it's the really the education is everything. Okay, you know, and I can't emphasize. I, I'm I'm sorry we're bouncing around, but let me just uh, give you a little notes on uh, our facility here. And I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play some it. video that you had sent me, uh, Barnett, about uh, this facility here. So as you're reading that stuff, I'm showing the video that all a bunch of clips I mashed together. So go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, the, the facility here. 
uh, obvious is 40,000 gallons. Uh, we have 30,000 cubes. We have 200 aquariums. Uh, we have protein skimmer, uh, industrial protein skimmer. We have beaded filters. Uh, uh, we have K media towers. Uh, we have medical UV uh, lights. Uh, we have ozone from Germany. Uh, we have triple towers, degassing towers, and we have chillers on everything. Okay, uh, our screening area is 10,000 gallons, 1,000 cubicles. We have uh, 100 aquariums, protein skimmer, diatom filter, industrial diatom filter, trickle tower, medical grade UV, ozone, and chiller. Quarantine area, okay, is 2,500 gallons, 20 aquariums, and then we have air bubble system. Uh, okay, um, then we do a dripping station. Everything is a fresh water bath with medicine. Uh, our anemone system is 15,000 gallons. Uh, we have protein skimmer, beaded filter, K1 media chamber, trickle tower, medical UV lights, ozone, and chiller. Uh, our invert system is 10,000 gallons, protein skimmer, trickle tower, medical UV lights, ozone generator, and chillers. Uh, we, uh, we have our re uh, reservoir water is 15,000 gallons, beaded filter, diatom, uh, a, a commercial diatom filter, a medical UV lights, and chiller. Shipment water is 2,000 gallons with a chiller. Uh, the facility incoming fish, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, we medicate everything uh, when, when the fish are incoming. Uh, our substations throughout the Philippines, uh, uh, I'll give you a few. Uh, Santa Ana, and, and, and uh, we, uh, who's that repeat? Santa Ana is in Capian. Yeah, yeah. uh, Sambalas Province, Santa Cruz, and Ma Musalina, and Subic. Um, Pangasinan Province, Quezon Province, Cavite City, Batangas Province, um, uh, Labang, I mean, uh, Labang, Occidental Province, uh, Catacuanas, uh, Bico Province, Maspate Province, uh, Mary Duque Province, Cebu City, Palawan, uh, that's in Coron, uh, Sabuanga, and Tawi Tawi. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Fifteen substations with three more going to be built this year. Thank God that uh, we can move around with the COVID. Uh, uh, the net training uh, done so far is in Santa Ana. We've trained 30 divers. Labong, Occidental, Maduro, 30 divers. Mapanas, Northern Samoa, 30 divers. Catacuanas Province, 30 divers. And Vico, 30 divers. Um, the future net training will be in Kala Islands, 30 divers. La Up, Mindanao, Occidental, Mindoro, 30 divers in Mapanis, Northern Samar. We'll go back into a refreshing course, 20 divers, and build the substation there. Um, let's see. Our overseas facility, it's Golden Ocean, PNG, and some Papua New Guinea. We've done two net trainings. Uh, we have a future substation with the Minister of uh, National Fish Authority. Uh, Jelta Wong will be in Rabul and also in, uh, in uh, Manos. Um, we're working with uh, the managing director, is Justin Ilawanka. He uh, basically, uh, the, it's a big complex uh, uh, of fisheries in, in Papua New Guinea. So the minister's in charge of investment and the managing director is in charge of running the operation in Papua New Guinea. And uh, Minister Jelta Wong, uh, we're looking forward to doing the substation again in Rabul, and Manos, and uh, with uh, the managing director, Justin Ilwanka. Hope I'm saying his last name right. Ilokini. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> managing director, Justin Ilokini. Um, we work hand in hand uh, with the 24 7 day to day operation. Um, and then Blue Ocean and, uh, and Madagascar. Uh, we have a whole crew over there, uh, and then uh, in Djibouti, and then 
Uh, hopefully, we'll get opened up in um, in uh, Sudan uh, once again uh, if it stabilizes, and then we're off to um, Myanmar uh, next uh, next week, and then Steve will be probably going to um, uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, uh, hopefully by in two weeks to do a refreshing course, training there, go to Rabul, train divers over there, uh, Manos, and then Steve possibly go over to Australia and then come back to the Philippines and then we'll do, um, see right now we have to, these net trainings is because the Philippines, the, the typhoon season, we have to time everything for the net trainings. Uh, you can't be doing typhoon season. So, uh, but in Papua New Guinea, uh, thank God there's no typhoon, so uh, we can train anytime. Just the winds there. Um, uh, I think it's from now. The season's good in Papua New Guinea. I think uh, uh, from from I think of March to uh, end of August. It's uh, winds, so that you get you get higher waves and. The current's pretty dangerous, so you have to be very careful. Um, uh, that's just a, a quick briefing. A quick briefing, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you guys have a lot on your plates. It's it's uh, it's really uh, impressive. And, uh, I mean, Barnett, you said when you were a kid, you know, you had like the 30 aquariums in your room and the bubbling sound up to fall asleep. I'm, I'm hoping that you guys get some sleep out there because it sounds like, uh, I you know, it's, it's, it's making my head spin in terms of how much stuff you guys have going on. Uh, sleep is a a, a, a a thing of of Greek gods get sleep. Okay, <laughs> fishmen. When you're in the fish business, okay, you know it's dedication. Okay, it's it's you know the airlines. You know, so if you're an importer and if you want to be strong, okay, now you have to really have a great crew and you have to bring the fish in when they're available because it's so difficult to get them into the with the airlines. What we're facing is, um, uh, you know, some places have gotten more like they think it's banking hours. Okay, our our industry is not made on banking hours. Uh, few companies really put their heart and soul. You know, the big wholesalers like you know, Seagrass Farms, Sunpet, um, uh, Fish Mart, Quality Marine, uh, uh, Underwater World, uh, Sea Grown Creatures. Um, uh, that that's in the United States. Uh, uh, the name of few, uh, you know, really working their ass off, you know, um, and it's hard. You know, I can only imagine, you know, what what's happened. You know, we again we're here on the front line, so it's different. You know, uh, I haven't back been back to the states in I think seven years. Um, but before that, uh, I've been here now. I think over twelve years. I've been overseas for the last 39 years, you know, you know, it's just, it takes a toll on you. Yeah, I bet. You know, flying, you know, now with the, during the COVID, the fly, when it opened up, wow, my God, you know how many swans I've had, okay? <laughs> my God, I swear to God, I, you don't want to know, okay? You know, you get swamped before you get on the plane. You get swamped at the airport. You get swamped when you get off the plane. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you, right. man. It's uh, it's been quite an ordeal. So, all right, man, we got we got a bunch of. We're past it. Now. We're past it. We got past the home. I think so. You know, and and, and I, I'm a true believer in God. You know, so you know, I, I believe that you know we're things will will level level out. They have you know? to. Um, you know, as long as, you know, everybody does their job. That's the bottom line, okay? But please, again, keep push. You're on the front line there in the United States, okay? You got to really got to push these wholesalers I mean, to be on the offense and get aquariums into the schools and the government buildings, okay? And don't charge them, okay? <laughs> don't make any money off it. Okay? <laughs> no, you can't. Because education is priceless. Okay, put it in, set up, do the maintenance, educate, 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 okay? And our trade will be the best in the world, okay? But if you sit back 
and expect everything to be handed to you, okay, you're going to have nothing at the end of the day. Simple and plain. Steve, you have anything to say? Uh, yeah, if, uh, if you take away the, the, the idea, the routine of RBS, take it away and see what would happen without it. Mm. Exporters sit on their butt in Manila and wait for fish to come in to Manila. They don't involve in improving the way in which we bring the fish in. They certainly don't get involved in how the fish are caught. The fish just come in in low variety and poor quality. If you don't get involved and get out there and be proactive, the fish supply doesn't really improve that much. What RBS has done is gone viral in this country, and it really needs to spread to Indonesia and a few yeah. others. But it's a good idea that people like to steal. It's not that RBS trained everybody and did everything in this country, but they made people jealous and envious of doing it right. And so the nets spread. The divers even wanted the nets without their own exporter supporting them. They really, really want to do it right. Divers are the ones that get put in jail if they get caught fishing illegally, not the exporter. So they wanted to change. This is an idea whose time has come. And the, the trade should have supported it better. But uh, without RBS, it wouldn't have been. We'd, we'd be shut down in half the provinces in this country already, instead of having opened up so many new ones. When the trend, the trend is restriction and shutdown, what did you hear this morning? New Guinea, Madagascar, Myanmar, we're opening up. We're, we're expanding, not shutting down, because we're the right ambassador for this kind of a trade. If you don't support the right thing, what are you doing? Because nature abhors a vacuum. A vacuum. If you don't fill it with something positive, it's going to get filled with something negative. If you don't make this a better industry, it's not going to get better. It's going to get restrictive and closed. Hawaii was mismanaged by the aquarium trade badly. They didn't put out a good image. They didn't argue well. They didn't make good points with the general population. Actually, they cried to each other. Oh, why are they going to shut us down? What are we going to do without fish? That doesn't carry with a population of people in Hawaii. You have to get more involved in your community, if you will. Education. And, 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 Hawaii, and Hawaii fisheries is some of the best in the world. Okay, Man, the management. Done so, right. So, yeah. so it shows you, again, he, he, the best mm -hmm. offense is the, is the best defense. If they mm -hmm. educate and put aquarium in and show them, educate the children, educate the government people, okay? Again, half these people, you know, who sign bills, I hate to say it, okay? They just, those people, in those, they're just signing. They're not they reading. Look what they're signing. Their aides did the work, and their aides put it in front of them. <laughs> right. Is this good? Yeah, sign it. Uh, you okay. Don't, you don't know what, 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 what we face over here. I ain't lying to you. And I'm not going to say things in what country, but I got a letter one time that was so appalling and insulting, Okay. You know, but unfortunately, you know, we had to educate on, on that situation, okay? You know, it's, 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 again, you know, people who get high positions and hold high jobs, you know, in government or, or anywhere in fisheries, if, you know, again, it's, if you're a private businessman, okay, shame on you, okay, and don't cry, okay, and, and thinking that these people know. They don't know. So you got to educate them. You got to, you know how they say, you know, lobby is a very bad word to use in the United States because that's just a, a lobby. But that's a yeah, correct way of saying, you know, corruption, you know. Yeah, we yeah. got to little lobby, you know. Right, 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 right. You know, you know? But as, a, as, as us in the industry, okay, we can checkmate everyone. Because what we're doing is great. No joke. We're giving a sustainable livelihood. We proved it in the field. The spare fishing example, two dollars a kilo for thirty uh, for uh, um, mustard tank. That's just I'm just giving an example just on that one fish, okay? You know, and then they could get one hundred and eighty dollars for thirty alive ones. Can you imagine? Thirty alive, one hundred eighty. Two dollars for thirty dead, okay? And how long did that go on for? Go to the fish market. You see what's in the fish market, okay? It's appalling. 
Now, not to say that people can't eat, but you got to just educate. It ain't that difficult, Keith, getting on the front. But you cannot give it to some crazy foundation, okay, yeah. with NGOs running around, okay? you got to give it to the private sector. The private sector has to work with the government, work with the fisheries, okay, and push forward, okay? That's how it'll work. And then the fisheries can be well-managed, better well-managed, okay? But if they don't work with the private sector, the fisheries, it'll never work, okay? But it's up to the private sector to work with the fisheries. It goes yeah. through traffic, okay? Obviously. Keith, I have a question. Yeah. Just a quick one. Can you pin comments in this video after it's been uh, after it's on YouTube? Can you pin comments? Yes, I think I can pin comments. It's it's uh, the comments that people um, put in, you know, after the live stream is over. So, um, so if we say we link three or four net trading videos at the end, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can, uh, I can definitely uh, pin those. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay. So, um, yeah, obviously you guys have a uh, have the right model going there. So, all right, we're getting a lot of fish specific questions that um, some folks would like to uh, ask you guys about. And um, ACI Aquaculture, Chris. Uh, is asking, um, finding a new species lately. Oh, and uh, by the way, he says, Jake and I are coming to visit when you're ready for us. PNG, exclamation point, exclamation point, Papua New Guinea, I guess that's what, that's what he's talking about. But uh, Chris's question is, finding a new species lately. Yes, we did. Uh, uh, we found in Papua New Guinea, uh, yeah, some ridge extensions, linear yeah. straps, yeah. linear <laughs> straps. Um, what else did we find? No, we found um, in Papua New Guinea uh, the lineatus grass. Okay, uh, it's further extensions that, that not knowing that it was there. Yeah, was great, great. range extension. Great assessor so, gobies also there, not huh. just Australia. So as we go on uh, in in Papua New Guinea. When we find stuff, we always give it. We uh, tell Jake. Uh, we'll tell Lemon. Uh, Lemon's last name is uh, uh, T. 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 Uh, he's done great work. Um, uh, so we always any new species. We talk, always uh, put it out talk to get, us about the uh, you know, the pack. Holy Grail angelfish. I'm uh, yeah. uh, I'm showing a picture of it right now. Yeah, we we're very. We, we only collect, you only find one every three to four years. That's a sick looking fish. Okay. Right. And that area is, that's Typhoon Alley. So we only get maybe five, six months a year to be able to collect there. Okay. So, you know, that is, in, yeah. So every three, four years, we'll only get one. Um, and uh, again, you know, when we post the fish, that's another thing. When we post the fish, uh, it's usually 99% it's sold within a minute, <laughs> seconds. Okay. So I don't want people, oh, 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 you know, you know, look, you know, I'll wait till the price comes down. What, what is the, uh, what is the, what is the retail on that? What is the retail on that Holy Grail angelfish? What it's sold in Hong Kong? I have no idea. Okay. But I can imagine. It was a holy grail price. <laughs> like okay? so north of north of hundred thousand. That, that one went to Hong Kong. Uh, that probably went uh, in Hong Kong. You would have to sell it. Probably he probably sold it for twenty thirty. You know, you know, in Hong Kong. The last one went to Hong Kong. That was Richard. Yeah, uh, uh, um, yeah. One. Uh, I've dealt with Richard for uh, thirty nine years. Uh, he's great. I love Richard in Hong Kong. Uh, Yacht Wong Aquarium, I think it's, uh, what's it now? Uh, Ocean? Ocean World. Ocean World. Uh, and then um, the other three went to, um, in, uh, in Singapore, to uh, Air, Aquarium Air, Iwana. Iwana. Uh, so, you know, we get them and we post them. And They're gone. The, the real, <laughs> it's, yes, 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 yes. You know, and then people, you know, well, how much, you know, if you have to ask. <laughs> don't, don't like, ask. Something like that. <laughs> no. You know, and I'm not being No, nah, you're right. Okay? You get, 
But once I go, you know, guess what? Okay. If it's a holy grail, it's only seen once every three to four years. And if you have to ask the price, okay, you're not a buyer. <laughs> okay, it's either I want it, ship it. Simple and plain. There's no questions. And I hate to be like that. But, you know, I, you don't know how many emails uh, I get. In it, and then nasty, well, why didn't you tell me? And what was the price? No, 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 no. Listen, listen. Okay. <laughs> you know, if you're a player, okay, you're, you're, you're in. Okay, you just, you know, fish like that. And, you know, one in every three, four years, you know, it's a miracle. And it's not just the fish. If you handle fish that rare and that spectacular, you owe it to decompress the fish and handle it properly. Look how many peppermint angel fish mm. came from the Central Pacific and were not decompressed properly. And how many of them died? They sell and they die. That's an, an amazing thing. That, that, that you kill them almost on purpose mm. by not decompressing them. Whereas here it's policy. You have to decompress. Have to decompress. You have to protect the investment. It only makes sense from a business point of view to do that. You certainly don't want it. Why, why be cruel? Why not just be intelligent? Those, those give you, for instance, Keith, those peppermints that came up from three to 400 feet should have been decompressed for a minimum three days in the water. But they're in a hurry. That's, ex that's an expensive okay. proposition, I would imagine, right? Yeah, well, there's this, and I know a few of the people who who had that very expensive proposition, and you know, and, and you know, but again, you know, unfortunately, some people are blessed. They could, they get, you know, they could wipe money on their ass. You know, I hate to say it like that, but you know, but, but then there's people that you know really want it done right, and it can be done right. You know, so those fish, you know, a fish like that, you have to have the time. You have to decompress three to four hundred feet. Wait, wait, three days, about three days, right? Yeah, you know, for buyers to be so wealthy and to pay so much for a fish and to know so little about what it takes to bring the fish to them, they really, really need to educate themselves a little yeah. better as well. If the fish aren't decompressed well, they don't have a good prospect for survival. They have to, they have to answer questions. Another thing, we have a protocol here. Um, most of the fish, uh, um, we're giving them an antibiotic uh, uh, an injection, yeah. yeah. Um, we give them um, it's ventral, basically, um, a proprietary concentration, and uh, we give each of say the deep water fish that might be subject to a little bit of decompression trauma. We give them that injection, and it helps them sail through it, no problem. In the shoulder, yeah, just in the shoulder. Nobody does this, and I can get, and I can. I can look at all these exporters over there. No need to do it, okay? <laughs> now you can do it. Okay? <laughs> all right, Barnett, now hey. talk to us about uh, this beautiful magna, magma rassi you discovered was actually named after you. I got, I'm showing the, I'm showing the picture with uh, you in the middle with uh, holding the frame picture of the, uh, the fish. Great. That, that, that was just a, a great uh, honor and a blessing that they... Um, uh, finally, we got recognition after um, um, all these years. You know, realistically, uh, in the last 39 years, we've probably made over 100 discoveries wow. of species. Okay. And, and again, never ever ask. You know, you're always wondering, will that, you know, eventually, eventually something happened? And, 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 then, uh, uh, and then we've made this discovery in, um, in Madagascar, that, uh, the Corazon damsel. You know, and, and, and lemon tea, okay, uh, we work very close with them when we now find new species, we give it to them. And again, it was an honor. I was not looking for nothing of such a thing ever happen. You know, it, it is like the, that is the holy grail. It's being in this industry, all your life, dedicate yourself, and you get a fish named after your family's name. Wow. Pretty cool. Have, and like here, we uh, presented this to the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. Okay? That's, the, that's the picture that I'm uh, showing right there. And, and, and we're going to find in Papua New Guinea very soon new species, okay? You ain't seen nothing yet. You see the Space Cowboy over here? You ever seen the movie Space Cowboy? Yeah. Huh? Okay, well, that's what we are. We're Space <laughs> Cowboys, okay? And this is... 
This is the leader of the space cowboy. Okay, okay. So we're gonna send we're gonna send Steve over to that Rabu area with the working with the Minister of Fisheries, uh, Joe Wong, and the managing director, uh, Justin Elakini. Okay, excuse me, I'm just from the Bronx. <laughs> okay, um, and we will find new fish discoveries in Papua New Guinea. For sure. That's 110%. So stay tuned. Have your seatbelt on. It's going to be a bumpy ride, baby. <laughs> looking, <laughs> looking forward to it. All right, we got another question here uh, from Real Slacker. What's the best-selling fish? Okay, best-selling fish. If you're a hobbyist, okay, everything. Everything you have is in your heart. It's got to be here. Okay? Best selling fish. Matters what you have. What kind of tank you set up? Territorial tank? Yeah, you, you set up a, a community tank. What we sell best here? Um, uh, uh, blue hippo tank. Yeah. Blue, you know, that, that's a very uh, a sellable fish. Um, also, uh, uh, you know, powder blue tanks. Uh, uh, gem tanks. Uh, yeah, it's the um, price of gem tanks coming down uh, even more these days. I know it used to be really expensive. It should be. It should be. Okay. Right. If it was up to you so, guys, you know, right? I mean, uh, you don't set the price over here, right? Well, no, we don't. But we do give a price that it's a game changer compared to what it was. Yeah. You're talking. I think they were. Um, my God. Before it was $600 for that. Yeah. Now, now Steven, consider this. As soon as you plug in the RBS formula and divers of RBS, everything changes automatically. So wherever you take this show anywhere in the world, you're going to see the same kind of thing play out. They dive better. They dive deeper. They handle the fish better. They have an eye for it. And it just changes everything locally when this team gets into the Water, sounds sounds like to, you guys need to uh, open up a uh, an operation in Hawaii. Help those folks out. <laughs> well, we could surely educate them. Okay, the, the PR campaign would have been run different. Oh, we that. Yeah. <laughs> if, if we, we that would have been hands down, hands down. That okay. should have been more of a livelihood issue. Uh, yeah. You need to demonstrate more community benefit when you defend this industry. Not yeah. just uh, leave our fish alone. That doesn't play with anybody. Why save the industry? Why reform the industry? You have to give real reasons that the lay public's going to agree with. You know? And they didn't do that. It's crazy, Keith. You know what I mean? Again, offense, offense, offense. Okay? You know, educate them. You have to educate. It's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's our duty. It's, you know, for a private, private company, you know, if you want to go forward, you don't want to be regulated. You have to be on the offense, you know, you know, and, and, and do your part. You got to look at it, Keith. Another thing you have to say, anywhere in the world that operates stations, okay, like, for instance, in Sudan, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, I'm going Red Sea now, Djibouti, Eritrea, okay, success, Philippine divers, okay, Fiji. How they brought it over the top is when they brought in Philippine divers. We had an operation in Fiji. Don't get me wrong, the Fijians can collect, but it ain't nothing. Like if a, I'm not because I'm married to a Filipina, my family's Philippine. I'm on the front line. I see the difference of, of being in that tree and seeing divers from different countries, okay? There's nothing can compare to a Philippine diver. The best divers in the world. Everywhere they want to bring them in now. They become valuable or a hot commodity. They want them in, it's key, because they want them in Australia. Why? Because, you know, unfortunately, some people just don't want to work, okay? You know, so <laughs> that's a problem. So yeah, that's a problem. And, you know, so, so, again, in, um, uh, any, any successful operation overseas, okay, you will find Philippine divers, hands down, okay? It's instant experience. It's instant productivity and results. You might get a new fish in the first week, uh, but for sure you're going to get some incredible fish in the first week. 
without the normal training and break-in period of local folks. They will learn, but they learn a lot better alongside Filipinos because they see what they're doing and they, then, then they can copy it and then it accelerates their, their learning process. And see, every, and, and another thing, Keith, every country, they have different rules and regulations, okay? You know, so that's another hurdle we have to jump through. Okay, so when we, when we go, when we set up these stations, okay, it's, it's, everything is laid out beforehand, you know, with the government, with the fisheries. Okay, so we bring the Philippine divers in and we train the locals. For instance, you know, again, what I told you, when we do trainings and we train 40, you know, everybody will show up for a training and say they're, they, because if they're doing spare fishing, everybody will show up for a training. It's all free equipment, and I have no problem yeah. with that. Okay, it's just when you really look at it. My brother-in-law always says they can't train the whole world, and I always fight with Ricky. I go, "Yes, we can." He goes, "Well, only half of them are going to show up for work." <laughs> you know, the next, you know, and then to God's truth, but guess what? Everybody had an equal opportunity, and that's the that's the critical thing: is giving everybody an equal opportunity, and it's really up to them. And again, like in in, in Papua New Guinea. We go into these uh, villages, okay? We can train them, or they take a royalty. That's the system they set up there. The, the, you know, it's a new system. The problem is in Papua New Guinea, they are they they ran off that C Smart program, okay, which does not work whatsoever. You can't have divers free diving, holding their breath and expecting them to make a living, okay? Mm. They got to die off. Hook up or, or scuba tank. Now I understand they're worrying about uh, the, these local villages going for the sea cucumber, but this is seasonal for the sea cucumber. But you have to you have to make a difference. You have to be, give them the opportunity to either survive. Again, you know, so every area we have different logistically different you know headaches. You know, so going in there if the fisheries don't know. And you have people, uh, lower level people, that been trained off that. That's all their mindset is, okay? And then, you know, anybody can write fancy reports, you know what I mean? You know, and put their name on it. That don't mean shit, okay? It's being in the front line, making it work, and giving, making a difference, and give, making these people sustainably that they can live. Okay, and, and 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 survive. That's the bottom line. They have to be able to have an income, and by us going in the field again, making that difference. Okay, I'm a private businessman, but make sure we make sure that they they're able to earn. If countries have different systems set up, okay, and they don't follow and try, you know, we show them the path, but if they don't see that path. Then what can we do? You know, I mean, and not, not everybody's like that, but unfortunately, um, you, you get some blind people. Um, but again, a young man, we would like you to come out here, okay, and, and attend one of these net trainings, okay, and get out of Maine, okay, Vermont, and, 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 <laughs> Vermont, same thing, same thing, <laughs> freezing. Oh but, yeah, winter time here is awesome. Well, I love to ski, so. Now, skiing is great. It's just like playing ice hockey. Okay, <laughs> you know you can't you can't ski, you can't ice skate, right? Same thing. You know, skiing is very very hard in your legs, really hard. That is true. You know? I played ice hockey. I, I I love ice hockey. Okay, I played ten years up in uh, Toronto, up in Guelph. All right, so you know the winter. Air. I love winter. I'm a, I was born in February, okay? I'm a, I'm a snow bear. I love the cold. So much okay? so that you haven't Nothing visited in seven years, though. That's, uh, you know, you got to, like, uh, come back to the roots. Yeah, you're, you're right. But, you know, more important, you only have, you know, life's Well, so you short, have, you guys you know? have, um, you know, you've got a lot on your plates, obviously, you know. And, and uh, I think the message is loud and clear in terms of what we you know, here in the States and as hobbyists or whoever, uh, whatever you're doing here, that's, you know, whatever you're associated with, with the trade, 
it's uh, it's all about education and and it's about doing things right right i mean you know you guys are talking a lot about going that extra mile to do things correctly do things the right way don't cut any corners you know i mean that's true in anything you you know you, you should uh, really preach with you know life in general right but uh, you know especially in this um hobby that we're all involved with you know on, on the uh, on the other side of it in terms of taking care of the animals it's all about taking care of the animals and treating the animals with the best that you can treat the animals and i applaud you guys for um you know doing that on the front lines so you should be commended for all that um incredible work that you guys have been doing and will uh, hopefully continue to do in the future so thank you listen here's the future right here <laughs> my son sam Shuffman, okay he's going to continue with his uncle ricky okay I will go to my last breath. You understand? <laughs> last breath. No joke, okay? Okay. Steve, Steve, they'll find him on a reef with a scoop net, just just just, just frozen, <laughs> baby. Okay. His last fish to be trained. Tom, okay, he'll be like like in a laboratory, okay? A again, it's the dedication you have to have in your blood. Everybody has it, and you know. It's just what it's how much you put forward, you know. Again, the only thing I can say, I don't want to sound like a broken record, okay? Offense, 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 okay? Educate, educate, give back, give back, okay? You know, we should have in the United States or even in Europe, everybody who's listening to your show, okay? Put aquarium in the schools, put aquarium into the government offices. Educate, okay? When they see that every day, let me tell you something. When they have the worst day in their lives, the only thing they're gonna think, keep, is they're gonna wanna sit in front of that tank and just have their mind. Melt. Okay? When you go in a dentist's office, dentists, okay? The most scariest thing in the world. I, I love, my uncle was one of the most famous dentists, knock on wood. He was the head professor at Stony Brook University, Seymour Friedman. He worked on five presidents. He was the top root canal dentist in the United States. He won, I think, three awards in the Hague. Okay. He had a query. Okay. When you have, you know, you're a dentist, emergency room, hospitals, they have aquariums in there because it's it's proven science. It lowers your blood pressure. Okay. Well, let's lower the blood pressure of all these damn politicians. Okay. <laughs> let's put it in there. Let's educate them. <laughs> let's educate them. You know, yeah. you know. It's it's simple. It's really simple. But everybody has to do it, Keith. Okay. We could we could be on the offense, educate, and be a million miles ahead. And another thing is when we do these net trainings, okay, I'm talking to all our wholesalers and the our buyers, okay? Dig deep one, you know, don't bust my chops. Oh, you're doing another net training? I just gave for a banner. Can you imagine these net trainings cost our company? I think like fifty that anywhere from thirty-five thousand to fifty thousand dollars. Okay, and we asked for a banner. I think a thousand dollars for a banner from our, our exporters. Okay, sometimes it's like pulling the eye too. <laughs> oh, you're doing another one? I thought that thousand dollars is good for the whole year. Okay, <laughs> you know, you know, it's just you know, you know, I, I, you know, I mean it. He, you know, we do it, but you know, everything helps also. You know that we get the support. We put the banner up. Let me tell you something. We do have some people that support night and day. Okay. You know, the Seagrass Farms family. Okay. My God. Sandy Moore. Uh, anytime we do a net training, Sun Pet, Barry, um, uh, that amazing support we get uh, out in California. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, always we get it from uh, Quality Marine, Sea Dwelling, uh, Underwater World, and Asia. Uh, we get it, okay. But you know, you gotta remember, um, if we do three net trainings a year, okay, you know, we're running into like hundred fifty thousand dollars. What private company does this, okay? You know, and again, we're proud to do it. Not to say, and we'll keep on doing it. But again, just remember, you know, when I call you guys up and we're doing a net training, you want that banner? It ain't for the year, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you can make a program. 
sell a yearly banner for a yearly banner. So, um, all right, guys. I think we're gonna. Uh, I think we're gonna wrap it. Uh, Barnett, how can uh, how can folks find you? What's the best way uh, for them to find you? Uh, you know, if they wanted to ask you some questions or, or get involved with what you guys are doing. What's what's the best way to uh, to get a hold of you? Um, well, you get a hold of me a million different ways, but um, uh, you know, I'm on the front line team, so but like hobbyist questions and everything, go to your go to your uh, your aquarium store or your wholesaler. Okay, if, you know, if it's a wholesaler, they need to get in touch with us. We're available on WhatsApp, uh, uh, Viber, uh, Facebook Messenger, my email address. Okay, but I I can't you know to the hobbyist and everything. We love you. Keep the passion, okay? And also edu educate, educate. But you know, um, uh, you know, it'd be difficult if I had to answer every hobbyist. You know, yeah, that'd um, be a tall order. Trust me, trust me. I'll be snowed <laughs> under, okay? You know, we're. we're I, I was talking about line. more about the net trainings and all that stuff, you know, and and. Uh, net training. Go to yeah. YouTube. Go to YouTube. Put in obvious Fisher Road net training. They're all up there. All the videos are there. Cool. All the videos are obvious fish. What is it? What is it on YouTube? Yeah. Is it obvious fish road? Yeah, obvious fish road. Yeah, just go to obvious fish road on on, on uh, YouTube, and you can see it. You know, we're up there. Uh, uh, and you can watch see all the net trainings we've done. Um, and and again, uh, I really appreciate your time, young man. Okay, it's your Thursday night. What time is it now? Oh, it's, like, nice it's, it's past my bedtime. I gotta, I gotta get up. I'm, I'm going to Macna tomorrow there, so I gotta, I gotta catch a flight to, tomorrow morning. Go to Macna in Milwaukee. I'm sure you guys are jealous. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> well, hopefully there'll not be some good all. beer there in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Not an ounce of jealousy. Okay, whatsoever. Okay, we're on a front line. Okay, those those trade shows and everything. That's you know. That's a thing in the past. That's good for the, the hobby yeah. and everything. But you know, um, Magna, I, uh, uh, I, I think I spoke at the second or third Magna. It was in, it was in um, the Sheraton Hotel in Newark, New Jersey, and that's when it was just in the, just, uh, just starting out. Really, very, and uh, we spoke about net training and and it, it was nice and everything, but. After that, I've never heard from them ever. No support from them, nothing. Okay, so I'm not impressed with Mac yet. Okay, the, the trade that cried when Hawaii shut down has not been really good at, you know, hitting it off. There should be a lot more responsibility in the in the forums. They should feature, they should feature net training, environmentalism, aquarium reform in general. Because don't take for granted that you have a trade in the future. You have to earn it. it. It'll probably disappear by itself unless you're proactive and show benefit for the trade and benefit for the locals. And another huge benefit we didn't even touch on is diver safety mm. training. All the divers that catch tropical fish for you are at risk. And being generally poor people, they don't know a lot about diving safety about decompression and air embolism and you know what time is safe for them so that's a huge part of the rbs program is to teach and enforce diving safety protocols across the board with all the with all the other trainees they all get it and it's important and it's just corporate responsibility to do that to take care of your people so that they don't die catching little clown trigger fish like they used to which is terrible yeah. news. So we don't yeah, need for that. sure. Right. All right. Well, listen, guys. Again, I uh, I applaud you for uh, for what you guys do, being on the front lines, the uh, the uh, the foot the foot soldiers out there. And um, we, uh, I as a hobbyist, really appreciate what you have done. And um, you know, the uh, the future of the hobby really depends on people like yourselves to uh, to keep it sustainable and, and moving forward. But, you know, just I, again, I, I, I kind of dwell on the animals themselves. And um, I think that, um, you know, what you guys are doing, it's, um, you know, you're you're setting the gold standard, right, in terms of collecting fish and, and um, you know, exporting the fish. So it's a, um, yeah, I, I, 
it, I learned a lot tonight. I'll, I'll put it that way. And, and um, hopefully a lot of other people did uh, learn a lot. And uh, I think your, your key message in terms of education and spreading the word like that and, and, and giving of your time, right? It makes a lot of sense. Yes. Very important. Another thing, Keith, there's other countries that are doing it directly too. You know, Australia, okay, has a very good uh, uh, fishing uh, uh, industry for the aquarium fish. Uh, Fiji, you know, they, they, they're doing it correct. Okay. Uh, uh, Tonga, um, uh, when Vanuatu was there, uh, hopefully we will go back to Vanuatu and open up there. Um, so, you know, what we're doing here in the Philippines uh, and then spreading into other countries, Madagascar uh, 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 and the Red Sea, and, and now in Papua New Guinea, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blessing that we are able to march forward to give a sustainable livelihood to the coastal community and educate everyone in this. So it's, you know, we're a big family. And uh, now that you're part of our family, uh, Keith, you know, put the word out, push it. You're going to be going around and, you know, and, 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 and one thing about Jake Adams told me, he told me your, your show is excellent, you know, you know, and realistically, I'm that busy. I think twice or three times I was supposed to be talking with you. Okay. And now you see why, how difficult it is, but when Jake told me, he was a Barnett, he was just, you know, he, he just gave you such high praise and everything. And meeting you and everything, uh, uh, anytime you want to touch base with us, you know, no matter where we're at, we'll, we'll climb up a coconut tree and, and get that <laughs> signal for you. Jake. I love to, I'd love to have you guys back on for sure. I think it was, uh, it was awesome. And, um, yeah, really appreciate what you folks do. It's just incredible. Well, God bless you, okay? God bless the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, and, and Madagascar. God bless the world. And, uh, and and have a safe trip out there where you're going tomorrow. And uh, say if you see anybody we know, especially Jake Adams, tell him you said uh, hello. Uh, give him a big hug from us, okay? A big hug. Okay, so thank you again, Keith. God bless. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And with that, we'll do a wrap on the show. I want to... Um, Thank you, you guys, again, for uh, taking all this time to, uh, to be with us and educating us. I also want to thank Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine for being the uh, sponsors of this live stream and supporting this live stream. I also want to thank all you folks that have uh, tuned in and um, put your comments and questions in the chat. Thank you so much. I also want to give a big thank you, shout out to Paul, who was our moderator. I also want to let you know that all episodes of Wrapping with Refum are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. My next Wrapping with Refum live stream will be on Thursday, September 22nd, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Gene DeViglia. Pack that name. Um, from Reef Labs, DeViglia. Sorry. Should be another great show. If you want to check out the full upcoming schedule of guests on ReefBum.com, go to the YouTube section. Until then, be safe and be well, and we will see you next time. Later.